All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Sunday, April 9th, 2023. Uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday for some. Hope everybody's doing well. So uh, I did a Facebook post uh, today that got uh, about 1,400 likes, 1,500 likes. And it dealt with some of the origins of uh, Easter. And it talked about East, Easter, Istra, Oistra. And I said we would do a uh, broadcast tonight dealing with this history. Okay, so normally on Sundays, I'm on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. Since it is Easter Sunday, the radio station is shut down for uh, live shows. So I said we'll broadcast here. Okay, so I hope everybody's doing well. Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. You're going to learn a lot today, a lot about history, a lot about some ancient history as well. And also, we'll give you uh, information about the online history classes that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understand the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school, and um, Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. All right. So uh, let's look at the post that I did today. Many of you saw it and uh, commented on it. Is on our Facebook fan page, uh, The African History Network, The African History Network, and uh, I did a few. Uh, I did a few posts. Let's look at this here. So yeah, this one here got uh, fifteen hundred likes. Uh, let's flip over and look at this. And if you don't follow us on our fan page, The African History Network, you should. So you definitely want to do that turn on live notifications so you know when we go live also okay so this is the post that i did today uh and it says and hopefully you can uh see this let's see if we can zoom in some on this here all right that's about the best i can do okay so it says um first of all we have this painting here depicting the last supper with African people as um, Yeshua or Jesus and uh, his 12 disciples as Africans, okay, because we know these were African people. Uh, it says Easter is a movable Christian holiday or a movable feast celebrating the resurrection of Yeshua, Y-E-S-H-U-A. And Yeshua means uh, Jah is salvation in Hebrew. Jah is salvation. Or Jesus, which is the Greek form of Joshua, J-O-S-H-U-A. Now, Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. The first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox, and vernal is Latin for spring, S-P-R-I-N-G. Vernal is Latin for spring. The vernal equinox uh marks the first day of spring which usually comes on march 20th or march 21st uh and when easter is celebrated is based upon astronomy okay when easter is celebrated is based upon astronomy this was one of the results of the first council of nicaea in 325 a.d one of the first of about 21 ecumenical councils from 325 AD to about 1870. And we know as a result of the uh, Third Council of Trent in 1563, we know as a result of that, they're trying to recalculate uh, when Easter is going to be celebrated. So this is this leads to the creation of the, Gregor of the Gregorian calendar introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th uh, about 1582, 1583, uh, common era. Okay. So that is the calendar that we use today. Prior to the Gregorian calendar, they were using the Julian calendar named after Julius Caesar. All right. So, uh, unfortunately a lot of, a lot of African-Americans celebrate Easter, but don't know 
uh, when to celebrate it besides it being on the calendar or their pastor telling them uh, Easter's coming up and, you know, uh, celebrate Easter and we're going into Lent, the 40 day uh, period of uh, uh, sacrifice and and you give up something for Lent, things of this nature. All right. OK, so this deals with uh, astronomy. OK, let's continue. Now, I said that you can look up uh, Easter in an encyclopedia or dictionary and it would tell you when Easter celebrated. OK, and uh, so we're going to deal with some of this history today. So we got fifteen hundred likes so far, about two hundred and seventy four comments, four hundred and eighty shares. All right. So let's look. At, uh, let's continue. Now, whenever I speak about information like this, that may be deemed controversial or something like that, I usually do my disclaimer because I'm not telling people, especially African-Americans, not to celebrate Easter. What I'm saying is that we need to know the history of what it is that we're celebrating. OK, we know that we need to know the history of what it is that we're celebrating. So this um presentation is called easter origins pagan traditions rabbits laying chicken eggs the exodus and black people okay easter origins pagan traditions rabbits laying chicken eggs the exodus and black people and i know the ten commandments was on this weekend and a lot of our people uh sit up sit up every easter and and watch the ten commandments and Watch Yul Brenner portray uh, uh, Ramses II, Rometsu, and and watch Ann, Bas Ann Baxter portray Nefertari. Okay, uh, we'll we'll deal with that later on in the uh, presentation. Okay, so let me uh, flip over here just a second. Okay, so it, it, here's my disclaimer. I know I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness. OK, just because you may disagree with it or, or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to understand what it is that I'm talking about. So I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. And I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. Now, the reason why I say this is because oftentimes when people hear something that contradicts what they've been taught, what they believe or what they think they know, they automatically reject it without doing any research to determine the validity of the new information that they're learning. And at the same time, they usually don't use that same level of scrutiny to analyze, critique, or reevaluate what it is they believe or what they think they know. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside of the circumference of your own awareness. All right. So uh, those are some of the things that we're going to deal with in today's broadcast. All right. And I encourage people uh, to read the books. Uh, African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide by Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, book number one, book number one and book number two, African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide. Because in these books, he deals with the history of all these European holidays that we have been taught to celebrate. OK, and once again, I'm not telling African-Americans don't celebrate Easter, but you should at least know the history of what it is that we have been taught to celebrate okay we should at least know the history of what it is we've been taught to celebrate and once you understand the origins of what it is that you've been taught to celebrate it may if you decide to continue to celebrate these european holidays it, it may change how you decide to participate in it because you have more information and i've studied the history of all these european holidays that's why most of them i don't celebrate uh mother's day father's day yeah you know i do that but uh christmas easter valentine's day thanksgiving now we may get together with family for christmas and 
down uh, Easter and uh, uh, the Thanksgiving or Misgiving Day. We may get together with family. Yeah, we should get together with family on those days. But we have to do a better, uh, have a better understanding of what it is that we're taught to participate in. OK, it's just like during uh, St. Patrick's Day. I posted here on our fan page, the African History Network. Um, I said, if you celebrate, uh, if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black and green on African Liberation Day? If not, why not? Which is May 25th, African Liberation Day. OK, so we've been taught to celebrate these uh, holidays going back to when we were children and even as adults. We really don't understand the history, what it is we've been taught to celebrate. OK, so let's look at um, some history dealing with Eastern. We're going to look at uh, a few different sources here. And you don't have to take my word for any of this. Proper documentation ends all conversation. OK, you can go research this yourself. This is why I'm going to give you sources uh, to go research this yourself. All right. So Easter is a movable feast. We're going to look at what determines when Easter is celebrated. Why is it on a different date each year? Uh, we know it, it, it celebrates the resurrection of Yeshua, who uh, in English we've been taught to call Jesus. But if he was crucified on a Friday uh, and then resurrected on a, if he was crucified on a particular date and resurrected that Sunday on a particular date, why don't we commemorate it? on that particular date on a sun uh, that particular date each year all right so let's look at this now uh what is easter easter is a christian holiday is actually the most important holiday in christianity easter is a christian holiday that celebrates the belief in the resurrection of uh yeshua or Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Christ, because Christ is a title, not a name, coming from Christos, which is Greek, coming from the comedic charest, uh, meaning the rising of the spirit. And Christ, and, uh, Christ basically refers to anointed or the anointed one. In the New Testament of the Bible or the Helios Biblos, the sun book, Helios meaning sun, S-U-N, not the S-O-N. In the New Testament, of the of the bible the event is said to have occurred three days after yeshua was crucified by the romans and died in roughly 30 a.d or 30 common era okay 30 common era or 30 a.d anno domini in the year of our lord and a.d does not mean after death the holiday concludes the passion of christ a series of events and holidays that begins with Lent, L-E-N-T, Lent, which is a 40-day period of fasting, prayer, and sacrifice, and ends with uh, the Holy Week, ends with the, which includes Holy Thursday, okay? Uh, this is a celebration of Jesus, uh, celebration of Yeshua's Last Supper with his uh, disciples or apostles, okay? The Last Supper, the 12 apostles, also known as Monday, Thursday, M-A-U-N-D-Y. Then you have Good Friday, uh, where Yeshua was crucified. The day uh, Yeshua was crucified, so you have Good Friday, was this the uh, observation of the crucifixion of Yeshua or Jesus? And then you have Easter Sunday, which many people today call Resurrection Sunday. Okay, Resurrection Sunday. And if we talk about resurrection. Uh, okay, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Okay, so when we talk about resurrection, the first one to be resurrected, we know, was Asar. Okay, going back to ancient Kemet and going back to the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And uh, we know that the uh, Tekken or the Washington Monument is a symbol of asar's resurrection okay his body was cut up into 14 pieces by his brother uh set and it was all set his wife who the greeks called osiris that went and collected 13 of the 14 pieces and the one piece that was missing according to one version of the story 
it was eaten by the Nile catfish that was the phallus, the penis. They erect a Tekken, which is a uh, symbol of the resurrection of the African king Asar. It's a symbol of transformation and resurrection. And we know there were uh, about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet. Uh, and the Washington Monument is a Tekken. The Washington Monument is an African symbol. And we know 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons, including George Washington. And there were 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're less than 12. So when we deal with, we're going to get deeper into this. Now, this may, once again, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Okay. So I can prove what I'm talking about. Proper documentation ends all conversation. Okay. I can prove what I'm talking about. And those that understand history know this. Okay. Cause we're, we're going to, we're going to get deeper into this. I'm going to give you some sources to go research. You don't have to believe a word that I say, go research this yourself. Proper documentation ends all conversation. So we, we look at the Tekken, which is a symbol of resurrection, the symbol of the resurrection of the African king, Asar, who comes from the, uh, what's known as the first holy trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And you have the Tekken that's been taken, you have different Tekken new that have been taken from Kemet from Egypt, from the Nile Valley region of Africa, taken throughout the world. They're, they're in New York City. One has been taken to New York City, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, uh, Vatican City, etc. Okay, so this connects us right back to African history, African culture. Now, if we go back to, let's go back to the uh, previous slide here that I was looking at dealing with Easter, because all, all of this is connected. Okay, Easter is connected to uh, Christmas, and then this is connected to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, now that the region of Africa. All all this history is connected. Uh, let me go back to the Easter slide here, just a second, because I'm working between two presentations. All right. Just a second, let's go back to this, uh, what is Easter? All right, hold on this. Okay, here we go. Got to put that back into presentation format. All right. Okay, just a second here. Let me... Yeah, resume slideshow. There we go. All right, give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast also. Invite your friends to tune in as well. All right, let's continue. Okay, so I had to close out one PowerPoint presentation. Um, okay, so Good Friday on which uh, Yeshua, Jesus was crucified as observed in Easter Sunday. Now, although a holiday of high religious significance in the Christian faith, many traditions associated with Easter date back to pre-Christian pagan or what are called pagan times. Many traditions associated with Easter date back to pre-christian or what are referred to as pagan times we're going to talk about the word pagan because pagan has taking has taken on a very negative connotation when it comes to um european anthropology archaeology uh things of this nature okay and in its truest sense pagan is not something 
uh, that is negative. OK, but it has taken on a negative uh, connotation. And for more information, you can check out uh, Easter 2023 at history.com, official website of the History Channel. They have some good information there. Now, in Eastern uh, Orthodox Christianity, which adheres to the Jalean calendar, which is the calendar before the uh, current calendar that we use today, which is the Gregorian calendar. All right. And the, uh, the Gregorian calendar that we use today is based upon how long it takes the sun to rotate counterclockwise around the earth. OK, it takes uh, 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes and about 46 seconds. OK, this gives us our solar year. Then then uh, uh, every four years you add a full day, which is known as a leap year. So this is the calendar that we use today, which is uh, the Gregorian calendar introduced that uh, introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th, about 1582, 1583. All right, now, all right, let's continue. So uh, in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which adheres to the Jalean calendar, Orthodox Easter falls on a Sunday between April 4th and May 8th of each year, April 4th and May 8th of each year. And some denominations or Protestant Christianity, Easter Sunday marks the beginning of Easter tide or what's known as the Easter season, Easter tide or what's known as the Easter season and Easter tide, the Easter se Easter season ends on the 50th day after Easter, which is known as Pentecost Sunday, or you may hear it referred to as Pentecostal Sunday. Okay. So this is 50 days after uh, Easter. Now in Eastern Orthodox branches of Christianity, Easter Sunday serves as the start of the season of Pascha, P-A-S-C-H-A, -A, uh, which is Greek for Passover. And we're going to talk about Passover as well. And we're going to talk about the Exodus that we that we read about in the Helios Biblos, the Sun book, but that we see depicted in the Ten Commandments with you, Brenner. OK, so you don't we, we're going, we, we have to talk about the Passover. Um, OK, so the start of the season of Pasha, which is Greek for Passover, which ends 40 days later with the holiday known as the Feast of the Ascension, the Feast of the Ascension. OK, now, so what determines when Easter is celebrated? Because Easter falls on a different date each year. So if Yeshua resurrected on a particular Sunday, why don't we commemorate that particular date? OK, uh, uh, each Sunday, whether it was whether it was uh, April 25th or May 2nd, whatever it is. All right. Now, the complicated dating dating uh, for Easter was set in 325 Common Era A.D. at the First Council of Nicaea, which scheduled the festival to be celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon occurring next after the vernal equinox which falls on about march 20th march 21st it can fall early in the morning on march 22nd but you're dealing with that period of time however if the full moon occurs on a sunday easter will be celebrated the following sunday okay so basically easter is celebrated on the first sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox all this deals with astronomy same thing dealing with christmas OK, nowhere. In the, now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Jesus, the Christ or Yeshua was born on December 25th. That nowhere in the biblical text does it state that. OK, so uh, the reason why. Yeshua's birthday or uh, is it, celebrated on December 25th is based upon astronomy and that deals with the winter solstice. All right, we'll, we'll come to that in just a minute. Okay, the winter solstice. Make a note of the winter solstice. 
because that deals with astronomy as well. So oftentimes we're taught to do certain certain things, but we don't know why we're taught to do it. Because if we understood that all this dealt with astronomy, well, we know that it was African people who created astronomy, who, who discovered astronomy. That will cause us to start studying it more. That would cause us to then start tracing all this back to ancient Africa. And then once that once that happens, it's pretty much game over after that. Once we reclaim our mind, and just as the 13 pieces of Asar's body were put back together, and Asar is eventually going to be resurrected, then you start having the resurrection of the African mind once you trace this all back to ancient Africa before foreigners, fakers, and fools came into the continent of Africa, misinterpreted what we had, stole it copied it distorted it and then misrepresented it to the world like they invented it themselves then taught it back to us taught it back to the descendants of african people who don't really have that collective knowledge so we get a a a a, a, a watered down version some people may call it bastardized but we, we ain't gonna take it there but we get a watered down version of what our ancestors had and taught but it comes through the cultural filtration system of Europeans. And Europeans learn less than 10% of what the ancient Africans knew. All right, so the date of Easter can fluctuate between March 22nd and April 25th because the Western churches, Catholic and Protestant, now follow the Gregorian calendar. The Eastern, the Eastern churches, which follow the unrevised Julian calendar celebrate Easter and other church holidays on different dates. In the Orthodox churches, Easter marks the beginning of the ecclesiastical year. Okay, now the Gale Encyclopedia, uh, online Gale Encyclopedia has some good information and you can access that at encyclopedia.com because a lot of this information used to be at answers.com and I printed up, I have like binders full of information I printed up over the years from answers.com. Uh, so this is here, like I printed this up April 12th, 2011. And this is from uh, answers.com that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So I keep all this stuff. People that know me, I got, if you saw the office, I have thousands of articles printed up here. This is the type of research I do. So encyclopedia.com has this same information that um, answers.com did. So this comes from the Gale Encyclopedia. This is just one of the numerous sources that I have dealing with the uh, history of Easter. Okay. So you can check that out. Uh, but this is at encyclopedia.com now. All right. Now. Let's look at, uh, I mentioned the winter solstice. Okay, we're going to go to that here in just a second with the winter solstice. Also, if you all like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. We're celebrating our 13th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. Uh, we started March 10th, uh, 2010. And uh, you, you can support us, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App and through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show we also have the information on the home page of our website uh the african history network.com uh the african history network.com we have the information there as well it helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills uh do the research for our sunday night show uh as well and i'm on 9 10 a.m superstation wf usually they're closed the, uh, the station shut down the day um because of Easter holiday, but we'll be back on the air live on 910 WFDF uh, next Sunday. Okay, now I I mentioned um, the winter solstice, right? And I do a, a, a three hour lecture dealing with uh, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. All right, so what determines when uh, Christmas is celebrated? Now, I was in, um, back in 2011, I was in 
uh, CVS Pharmacy here on uh, Jefferson Avenue in Detroit. I was at CVS Pharmacy and I was standing in the checkout line and I see at the checkout counter, I see this book called um, the, Res it was, uh, the Life of Christ, The Life of Christ. And it talks about how his uh, death and re rediscovering his life, death and resurrection, how it changed the world. Right. So I, I go pick it up and I start looking through it. And I still have it, the original one from uh, what I put it. I still have the original one somewhere here in the office. But I start looking through it and I come across page uh, 55, right? Page 55. And on page 55, it says this. In Christianity's early years, people debated when Jesus' birth should be celebrated. In Christianity's early years, people debated when Jesus' birth should be celebrated. Some Christians were against observing it at all as they did not want Jesus compared to Pharaoh. They don't tell you which Pharaoh because Pharaoh is a title, not a name, compared to Pharaoh and Herod, whose birthdays were commemorated. But in the fourth century, common era AD, Pope Julius I made it official. Christ's birth would be celebrated on December 25th, referring to Yeshua or Jesus, Jesus the Christ, because Christ is a title, not a name. Uh, and in the Helios Biblos, you know, it is uh, referred to as uh, Jesus of Nazareth. OK. But the the title, the, the name, the word Christ is a title. So is Jesus the Christ. Now, December 25th was already considered the birthday of the son, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N. The son of God, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N. Using the technology available at the time, ancient astronomers observed that on December 25th, the day started getting longer again. They recognized the date as the winter solstice, the winter solstice, when the sun is born again each year. So the, the winter solstice, uh, so what happens is, uh, Around December 21st, the sun moves into its lowest point in its journey throughout the 12 constellations. And from December 22nd, 23rd, 24th, it appears that the sun does not move. The sun stands still or the sun is dead for three days. Then on December 25th, the son of God, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N, moves one degree northward. And this is known as the birth date of the son of God or the rebirth of the son. And each subsequent day, starting with December 25th, there's more and more sunlight. There's the, 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 the duration of sunlight each day increases starting with December 25th. So the December 25th in ancient times or the equivalent to December 25th on whatever calendar you're looking at, that was looked at as the rebirth of the son or the son of God. OK, and this is dealing with the winter solstice. So this all deals with astronomy. All right. Now, the Romans celebrated the birthday of the God Sol Invictus, S-O-L, S-O-L, that that word soul means son, S-U-N. Soul Invictus in Latin means unconquered son. They celebrated the birthday of the deity Soul Invictus on December 25th. The day was also recognized as the birthday of Mithra, the sun deity of the ancient Persians. And December 25th was also the birthday of Attis, A-T-T-I-S, an agricultural deity or God worshiped in Asia Minor. By choosing December 25th, 
the Christian church avoided upsetting the masses. No one wanted their festivals canceled. So the Christian church simply combined the new, th this new Christian holiday with pagan traditions. So as, as the, as the Romans are conquering people, and bringing more people under control of the Roman Empire, they're incorporating into the Christian celebration, they're incorporating into the Christian celebration what people are celebrating that they're conquering, what people are already celebrating that they're conquering. They're incorporating that into it. And that's, that's one of the ways you get people to accept your cultural traditions and your ideologies by incorporating aspects of what they are, are already celebrating into what you are imposing upon them so they see similarities is something familiar to them and they're less likely to fight against it or rebel against it so so this came from um the life of christ okay the book the life of christ this is from uh the the was the national Bible was it the American Bible Society? Okay, and it's distributed by Time Home Entertainment Books, like Time Life Books, Time Magazine, all of that. So what what happened was this was the 2011 edition, and I did a number of presentations and have ex excerpts of it online, things like this. And I bought this book. This book was like twelve dollars. I bought this book specifically for what's on page 55 because i said people are not going to believe this i already knew this history okay from numerous sources i mean you read christianity before christ but dr john g jackson uh he breaks this history down uh there and tony Brown talks about it in uh now valley contributions to civilization all right and i've got christianity before christ right around here i just saw it before we started right here before we started the broadcast uh so yeah right here christianity before christ but dr john g jackson so what happened was a sister reached out to me who watches my broadcast this was probably about 2012. she said that she purchased the new edition of this which was like the 2012 edition she purchased that and the information that's on page 55 was not in that new edition okay not the singing group, not Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike, and Johnny, not, not the singing group, but the new edition of the book, the 2012 edition, they ain't had that information in there, okay? Because I was telling people, go get this book. You ain't going to believe this. They're telling you where this stuff comes from, all right? Now, they've come out with a new version, and I bought this last year. I bought this in April of 2022, now, this is called The Resurrection of Jesus. I haven't, uh, I haven't had time to scan this one. The Resurrection of Jesus, okay? This is about, well, how much I pay for this? About $13, $14, something like this. Uh, yeah, $13.99. Now, in this one, and I got this from CBS also. This is put out by okay centennial bible but this is one of those uh expensive books you see at the checkout stand at cvs now in this one on page what page was that they actually talk about asar aset and heru hold on i had it bookmarked see i'll find this here because what they said was and they actually had a picture of all set and they're trying to separate uh where all this stuff comes from just say let me find oh right here here we go so this is on page 67 and this is the 2022 edition. 
it says pagan mythology and resurrection the differences so i guess they got a whole lot of feedback and somebody said okay now look you need to come out here and you need to distance yourself because we don't want people thinking this goes back to ancient kim and ancient egypt because then they're going to start reading now valley contributions of civilization by tony browder and they're going to read christianity before christ but dr john g jackson they're going to read uh african people in european holidays but dr shaka musa barashango you know they're gonna start listening to the african history network all this then it's gonna be like little flip said game over so we gotta we can't we can't no we can't let them know where all this stuff comes from so it says here pagan mythology and resurrection the differences it has become commonplace to argue that jesus's resurrection is simply one more example of a common motif in ancient mythology in which a hero dies and rises again okay advocates uh of this position point to parallels between jesus and the greek gods Attis and adonis or the egyptian gods horus and osiris but a deeper inspection shows the parallels are forced they say the parallels are forced and the resurrection account of jesus bears little resemblance to these mythological fables they they they, they call see when you if you read uh Kersey gray's book uh the world 16 crucified saviors and i got that book somewhere here in the office it's probably on the other side you read christianity before christ by dr john g jackson they go through and show the similarities between all these crucified saviors but a deeper inspection shows the parallels are forced and the resurrection account of jesus bears little resemblance to the mythological fables then they go on to say pagans did not believe in resurrection one early church father said bodily resurrection quote unquote never crossed their mind the philo I, 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 don't, I don't know if he did a survey of all the people that they were calling pagans how did you come to that conclusion the philosophers on on uh the philosophers on mars hill mocked paul for his view because parallels between common opinion and his simply did not exist in egyptian mythology Osiris never rose from the dead. He ruled the underworld and served as the living king of the dead. The claim that Horus died after a scorpion sting is simply incorrect. He only became ill and was nursed to health by his mother. In Greek mythology, the god Attis was not resurrected his spirit entered a pine tree, hardly a reasonable parallel. The overwhelming historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Now, okay, now this is going to go outside and circumference of some people's awareness. Now, I ain't going to. Okay, how should I? How should I say this? Okay, okay, let me just continue. Hold on, let me just continue. Okay. The overwhelming, quote unquote, historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection in terms of eyewitness and firsthand contemporaneous accounts is in a completely different category than the legends and fables of mythology. Okay, now, they say in Egyptian mythology, Osiris never rose from the dead. He ruled the underworld and served as the living king of the of the dead it is true that he ruled the underworld but when we go and let me, and let's go to now valid contributions of civilization by tony browder okay to say that a sar okay, who the greeks called osiris to say that he oh uh actually let's go to um let's go to egypt on the potomac let's let's go there egypt on the potomac to say that a sar it was not resurrected is incorrect i don't know um what type of research they did on this they could have called me but they may be still mad at me because i exposed what was going on with uh <laughs> the 2011 edition okay 
I, don't, they, I think they may owe me some money. I don't know how many people went and bought that one because I told them to. So <laughs> they may they may owe me something. Let's look at this right here. Let's look at Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So I teach this. Uh, we we teach a lot of this in the uh, online history classes that I teach, especially especially ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'an for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't didn't teach you in school. Let's look at page 13 of Egypt on the Potomac. Okay. Let me flip over to this here, right here. Let's look at page 13. Now, this is Heru in the, the this is Heru, the sun, in the uh the falcon in the form of a falcon. Okay. If we go and look at this is page 13. Let's go back to page 12. Of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Uh, it deals with uh, a Sar impregnating uh, the spirit of a Sar pregnating or set after a Sar was killed by his brother Set. Okay. The spirit of a Sar impregnated his wife, and nine months later, the virgin or Set gave birth to their son Heru on December 25th. If this story, and we can back up a little bit here, uh, page 10. Stories of the first royal family are an integral part of the earliest mythology, history, and theology of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. But by every account, Asar was recognized as the founding father of Kemet. He unified the two lands of upper and lower Kemet that, that we'll talk about when we talk about Dahuti in just a minute and established a central government established a central government page 11 in the city of Menefer, which was renamed memphis by the greeks asar introduced writing agriculture law and religion to the people of ancient kemet prior to departing on a trade mission to enter africa asar appointed his queen Osset. You may see it spelled A-U-S-E-T or A-S-E-T or A-S-T. All set to rule in his absence. This is who the Greeks called Isis. This infuriated his brother Set, uh, uh, who felt that he should rule in Asar's absence. A rejected and angry Set, the brother, plotted to usurp his brother's rule, Asar. Shortly after returning to Kemet, Asar was assassinated by Set, who not only murdered Asar, but cut up his body into 14 pieces and scattered them throughout the land. So this is like Cain and Abel before Cain and Abel. When Aset learned of the murder and dismemberment of her husband, she fled the royal palace and cried a river of tears as she sailed down the Nile in search of Asar's remains. Okay, now Osset eventually found 13 of the 14 pieces of Asar's body. During a period of 10 weeks, Osset literally remembered Asar as she found each severed body part. She washed each part of Asar's body, anointed them with oils, and then wrapped the entire body in bandages. Osset created the first mummy in Kemetic history or ancient Egyptian history. It took her 70 days to find, reassemble, anoint, and embalm her husband, Asar. Thus, 70 days became the period for the mummification process that ancient Kemetic priests would follow for the next 3,000 years. Prior to Asar's burial, Osset reflected on their brief life together. She loved her husband dearly, even though they had never consummated their marriage. Osset was still a virgin and grieved because she would never bear Asar's children and produce an heir to his throne. All right, let's see here. Okay, let's continue. For some reason is coming up blurry. Let me try to fix this. 
All right. Now, the resurrected, uh, okay, let's see here. Let's back up. Prior to Asara's burial, Aset reflected on a brief life together. She loved her husband. Uh, Aset was still a virgin and grieved because she would never bear Asara's children and produce an heir to his throne. That's page 11. Let's go to page uh, 12. Miraculously, the spirit of Asar answered his wife's prayers and visited her body and visited her before he was laid to rest. This is the spirit of Asar. The spirit of Asar impregnated his wife. And nine months later, the virgin Aset gave birth to their son Heru on December 25th. If this story sounds familiar, it is because it has been modified and retold by many cultures for over 5,000 years. Yet it is the first story in recorded history of the impregnation of a virgin by a Holy Spirit and of a virgin birth. We're going to deal with more information on that. Because Browder talks about this in Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, also page 95. Now, throughout his youth, Heru, the son, was told of the great deeds of his father as he was gradually prepared to pursue his life's work to avenge the murder of Asar and reclaim his father's kingdom. As an adult, Heru confronted his uncle Set and defeated him after a protracted battle. Now, this is this is where it's the Asarian drama was called the Asarian drama. This is where the story of Star Wars comes from with George Lucas. This is where the story of Star Wars comes from. And Luke Skywalker, uh, Luke Skywalker killing Darth Vader. But he he resurrects his father. Darth Vader is his father, but he resurrects the good out of Darth Vader. So he at the end, when you watch Return of the Jedi, because this you have the trilogy before they came out, all these other movies, you had the trilogy, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. It's in Return of the Jedi that Luke Skywalker kills Darth Vader, but before Darth Vader dies, Luke Skywalker resurrects the good out of Darth Vader. Anakin Skywalker, he resurrects the good out of him. And um, he uh, Darth Vader kills the, uh, the the emperor. OK, to save Skywalker's life. And Skywalker is his son. All right. And we dealt with Obi-Wan Kenobi being, you know, being uh, who uh, really sacrifices himself also. Uh, and we deal with the spirit of Obi-Wan Kenobi. But um, George Lucas. His mentor's name was Bill Moyers. I mean, sorry, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Power of Myth. And Joseph Campbell taught George Lucas about all these different mythologies from different cultures. One of them was dealing with Asar, Asat, Aset, and Heru. This is where this comes from. In the Jedi Knight, uh, I interviewed Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene um, about this back in like 2015, 2016. The Jedi Knight come from the uh, Jed column, which represents the spine of Asar. OK, so there's, there's an African origin to Star Wars. Uh, there's an interview that Bill Moyer did with George Lucas. That gets into uh, a lot of this and gets into the mythology, things like this. OK, now let's continue. All right. Now, throughout his youth, Heru was told of the uh, deeds of his father. Uh, he was told of the great deeds of his father as he was gradually, as he gradually prepared to pursue his life's work, which was to avenge the murder of Asar and reclaim his father's kingdom. As an adult, Heru confronted his uncle Set and defeated him after a protracted battle. According to the ancient myth, after the battle, the victorious Heru was transformed into a falcon and flew into heaven to tell his father of his victory over Set. When Heru returned to Kemet and reclaimed his father's throne, Asar was resurrected. 
Asar was resurrected. Asar was resurrected and his spirit ascended to the throne of judgment where he presided over the souls of the deceased who appeared before him. Okay, he sits on the throne of judgment and you have the famous scene called the judgment scene. But Asar was resurrected. Okay, this is page 12 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Brown. Okay, now in the uh, page 67 of the resurrection of Christ, the world's greatest hope. Okay, I'm not saying don't buy the book. You, you can buy the book. I bought it. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you don't buy it and I bought it. You could, but here on page 67, where they said pagan mythology and resurrection, the differences, they said Asar was not resurrected. That's false. Asar's spirit was resurrected. They said Asar was not resurrected. That's false. And, and, and I surmise that they said Asar was not resurrected. Because then if you then if you admit that this is an ancient resurrection story before the story of Yeshua was resurrected. Then people are going to go and ask their pastor, wait a second, why aren't you teaching us this? They're going to go ask the minister, why aren't you teaching us this? They're going to start doing some research. But if you can throw them off the trail. And say, oh, that didn't happen. Well, then you can misdirect them. OK, and I'm not saying don't read the Bible. Yeah, we should read the Helios Biblos. I got one right here. See, I have a study Bible. New King James study Bible. This is the, was New King James in an at New King James study Bible. OK, New King uh, NKJV, New King James Version study Bible. The study Bible has 2000 pages and it came with a CD ROM. I, you know, so I bought this back in uh, April 5th. 2009 okay april 5th 2009 came with a cd rom also because this gives a deeper understanding see the devotional bible my devotional bible is like 400 pages the new king james study bible which was 40 dollars back in 2009 i don't know what it is now it's probably 140 dollars something like that with inflation i don't know <laughs> this is 2000 pages it has it gives you deeper understanding word definitions his, uh gives you like a geographical understanding different background is much a much deeper understanding the devotional bible is the bible that people sit up in church and 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 look at when the pastor talks and they say amen and hallelujah things like this and don't know what he's talking about okay that's the devotional bible all right <laughs> okay let's continue here a man coming from the Amen priest and priesthood also coming from ancient Kemet as well. Okay, I don't want to get too deep into this, but <laughs> so some people, they, they, so, so this is going to start causing people to ask questions, right? You don't have to believe a word that I say. Go do your own research. This is why I provide you with the sources. Proper documentation ends all conversation. And if I can get you to start asking questions, then you start seeking out answers, okay? Uh, if we look at this piece right here, and I talk about this in my uh, in my classes, um, there's a good article, but there's a good paper that deals with what's called the mystery religions, the mystery religions, and it talks about the influence. Of Asar or Set and Heru, or what the what the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. It talks about this, right? Now it's not written, it's not written by Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanin. It's not written by Tony Browder or Professor James Small or Dr. John Henry Clark or Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene or Dr. Ray Hagens, anything like that. It's not written by them. It's written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When he was at Crozier Theological Seminary, uh, between 19 between November 29th, 1949, and February 15th, 1950. The name of this paper that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote is called The Influence of the Mystery Religions on Christianity. The influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. Okay, now this is at the Stanford University. This is at Stanford University's. 
Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. All right. So long story short, I don't have time to get through the whole paper. But when we look at this here, what he is talking about is the influence on Christianity of these different mystery religions that are a retelling, a retelling of the same story of uh, the virgin birth adoration annunciation then then uh, a resurrection of a savior so he talks about the influence of osiris and isis the influence of osiris and isis dr martin luther king jr 1949 1950 said the egyptian mysteries of isis and osiris exerted considerable influence upon early christianity uh-oh exerted considerable influence upon early christianity he said these two great egyptian deities who worshiped past who, who uh, whose worship passed into europe because they were worshiped in europe also not just in kemet not just in egypt they were now they were revered not only in rome but in many other centers where christian communities were growing up See, this is where you get the worship of the black Madonna and child from all throughout Europe, because they were Europeans were worshiping African people. And, and the, the European country that probably has the most statues and paintings, references to the black Madonna and child would probably be France with uh, about 300 of them to this day, about 300 of them. Osiris and Isis, so the legend runs, were at one and the same brother and sister husband and wife which is true and they had they had never consummated their marriage but osiris was murdered his coffin body being thrown into the nile river and shortly afterwards the widowed and exiled isis gave birth to a son horus this is who the greeks call horus or heru meanwhile the coffin was washed up on the syrian coast and became miraculously lodged in the trunk of a tree this tree afterwards chanced to be cut down and made into a pillar in the in the palace at biblos biblos now biblos is a is the phoenician is the uh, phoenician capital at the time and this was a city known for producing papyrus and this is the city where the early christians go to to get the papyrus to copy down the stories that they see depicted on the walls of the Amen priest and priestesshood in, in these temples. Okay, and they copy these, these stories down and put them into a book. After recovering Osiris' Osiris' dismembered body, Isis restored him to life and installed him as king in the netherworld. Meanwhile, Horus, having grown to manhood, reigned on earth, later becoming the third person of this great Egyptian trinity. Okay, so read the rest of this. I don't have time to get through the whole paper for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is why I tell people we haven't studied Dr. King. And every Dr. King day, we disgrace him with these watered down, uh, try not to cuss. With these with, with these watered down dr king day celebrations sponsored by corporate america and i can listen i know a lot of people mean well but i can listen to them tell they ain't never studied dr king he was a black revolutionary and i'm like at least if you're going to read one thing about dr king at least read his last book where do we go from here chaos or community because he wrote five books so when I see people, I know they mean well, but they keep doing these watered down, uh, um, these watered down, we shall overcome, everybody hold hands, uh, celebrations of Dr. King and don't deal with the revolutionary Dr. King that called out the American government that fought against poverty, racism, and the military. Uh, and toward the end of both of their lives, Dr. King and Malcolm X's ideologies were converging. So when you read uh, 
this book here by James H. Cone, Martin Malcolm in America, Dream or a Nightmare. He goes through and shows you passages from their speeches and interviews, things like this, to where they end up both of their lives. Their ideologies were converging. And Malcolm, when Malcolm leaves the nation of Islam, he officially separates uh, March 8th, uh, 1964. And then March 26, 1964, uh, Malcolm meets Dr. King at the U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights uh, Act of 1964. And they just meet for a couple minutes. Malcolm tells Dr. King, I'm throwing uh, my heart uh, and throwing all of my heart into the effort of the civil rights movement because Malcolm joins the civil rights movement when he leads the nation of Islam. And one of the themes of the ballot or the bullet that he delivered at least three times that I know of uh, March 29th, 1964 in Washington Heights, New York, April 3rd, 1964 at uh, Corey Methodist Church in Cleveland, Ohio in april 4th 1964 at uh the historic king solomon baptist church here in detroit one of the themes of the ballot or the bullet was interjecting black nationalism into the civil rights movement he was talking about radicalizing the civil rights movement he talks about registering african americans as independents he's not telling people don't vote he's he's, he's saying push to get something tangible for your vote but he's talking about registering african americans as independents and then you look you read the speech from june 28 1964 uh, his um uh, by any means necessary speech where he announces the uh formation of the organization of afro-american unity that's a revolutionary speech because he lays out five the five the five planks of the OAAU's platform and one of them is dealing with politics okay being politically educated registering people to vote as independents voting intelligently he talks about education he talks about economics blackpass.org has the uh transcript of that speech everybody needs to read it because we haven't really most of us really haven't done a good job of studying either Dr. King or, or Malcolm X. Okay, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. Um, if you want to support the African History Network, you can do so, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We have the information on the homepage of our website also the african history network.com uh when you go to our website it will show it to you right there and uh also we have the information for the online history classes that i teach so if you think this type of information is is powerful really good the 12 week online history classes i teach is even deeper uh they're they're even deeper uh here's our cash app information now this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it'll say michael probably show my picture there there's about five or six fake african history network cash app accounts out there i've identified i'm still trying to get those shut down when you click on our link right here it shows our qr code also this helps us keep doing the research uh pay some of the bills buy the books uh keep producing our sunday night show etc okay all right and then uh the online history classes that i teach saturdays uh, i teach ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what it didn't teach you in school our next classes are uh saturday april 15th uh saturday april 22nd saturday april 29th 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded the class now is on sale 60 dollars regularly 130 dollars uh, even after the course is over with a year from now two years from now you can go back and watch the entire course you have full access to it and then uh the other class i teach on sundays black resistance movements from the haitian revolution u.s civil war civil rights movement the black power movement 1800 to 1968 that's on sale 60 dollars also all right so you can register for those we have a bundle pack uh the bundle is was 120 dollars. the bundle is 100 dollars for both classes all right let's continue here and let's look quickly here some of your comments uh so uh one pretty who's this one pretty 
okay one pretty boy 11 said good to see you and hear you mike he must be a kappa okay he must be a pretty boy kappa uh john uh jonna matthews gave us about 1400 thumbs ups and uh we've got uh, wilbur sana uh elliot c um one pretty boy said uh facts let's see who's this cynthia clark said dr king was woke hashtag love dr king was brilliant uh ishmael uh abdul said real interesting we've got cameron watching also sunflowers uh said good evening everyone and uh, uh rachel w said uh rachel from detroit uh michigan sending love to all okay all right let's continue all right now uh i want to go back to uh the easter information and then uh, i want to go to page 95 of now valley contributions to civilization by tony browder also because this is important information there that helps us to better understand uh, this history all right let's see here all right okay there we go i had to put this back in presentation mode All right, stand by. I'm trying to get back to this here. There we go. All right. Let's see where we left off. Okay, so where does the name Easter come from? Where does the name Easter come from? St. Bede also known as the Venerable Bede, B-E-D-E. -E. He was the eighth century, uh, the eighth century author of uh, Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis and Glorum, Ecclesiastical History of the English People. He maintains that uh, the English word Easter, E-A-S-T-E-R, the English word Easter comes from Eostre, E-O-S-T-R-E, or Eostre, E-O-S-T-R-A-E, who was the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. The Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. Now, other historians maintain that uh, the word Easter derives from uh, in albis, A-L-B-I-S, a Latin phrase that's plural for alba, a-L-B-A or dawn, D-A-W-N. That be and they say that they believe that those uh all in Albus became Eostarum, E-O-S-T-A-R-U-M, in Old High German. And Old High German is a precursor to the English language today. I'm I'm going with Venerable Bede. Venerable, Vener, the Venerable Bede's explanation makes more sense. Despite its significance as a Christian holy day, many of the traditions and symbols that play a key role in Easter observances actually have roots in pagan celebrations, actually have roots in pagan celebrations um, and observances, particularly the pagan goddess Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-E, -E, and in the Jewish holiday, Passover. Okay, now, what is pagan? What is pagan? Now, pagan is a word that is misused to speak negatively about a group of people. If we look at the American Heritage Dictionary, and there are other dictionaries you can look at, Merriam-Webster, etc., Pagan as a noun is an adherent of a polytheistic religion in antiquity, especially when viewed in contrast to an adherent of a monotheistic uh, religion. So pagan is used negatively 
And to say that, oh, these people were backwards, these were heathens, they believed in many gods and things of this nature, okay? Now, if we look at the etymological derivation of the word pagan, pagan comes from uh, Middle English, from the Latin, from the late Latin word paganus, P-A-G-A-N-U-S, paganus. From Latin, meaning country dweller, civilian, and it also comes from pagus, which basically means country or rural district. So basically, pagan, historically, referred to somebody who was a country dweller, somebody who lived in the country, they lived in a rural district, and they were looked at as being you know, backwards or something like that. Just like like today we look at we may look at some people in the South as being backwards or, you know, something like that. They um, they may still make moonshine or, or something, you know, they in the country. You say that, you know, they backward, they're backwards. They may have an outhouse or something. So that's that's what pagan originally meant. OK. Uh, so you can check out the American Heritage Dictionary or Merriam-Webster or others for uh, to get a better understanding of pagan. Now, like many other Christian feasts, the celebration of Easter contains a number of originally pagan or folk religious elements tolerated by the Christian church. Among these are customs associated with the Easter egg. Among these are customs associated with the associated with the Easter egg. Uh, Easter, uh, Easter breads and other special holiday foods and the European concept of the Easter hare, the Easter hare, or in America, the Easter rabbit. Okay, all these are um, traditions from uh, other cultures. Now, Easter breads and other special holiday foods and the European concept of the Easter hare or in America, the Easter rabbit, which brings baskets of candles and colored eggs during the night. Now, somebody will probably ask the question, well, why do rabbits lay chicken eggs? Why do rabbits lay chicken eggs? What does this have to do with Easter? Okay, and that would be uh, that would be a very good question. Let's look at this. Now, the pagan roots of Easter involve the spring festivals of pre-Christian Europe and the Near East, and and the Near East, which celebrate the rebirth of vegetation, welcoming the growing light as the sun becomes more powerful in its course towards summer. So you're dealing with astronomy once again, because that is the uh, summer solstice, which falls on June 20th or 21st, right around there, the summer solstice, which marks the first day of, of uh, summer. Now it is significant that in England, and Germany, the church accepted the name of the pagan goddess Easter, E-A-S-T-R, and the Anglo-Saxon name is Eostra, E-O-S-T-A-R, E-O-S-T-R-A, I should say, Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-A. Her name has several meanings, and they, they, uh, they accepted her name for this new Christian holiday. In Mediterranean Europe, Italy, Spain, and France, Christianity adopted Pascha, P-A-S-C-H-A, a word derivative of Passover, from which comes the adjective partial for things pertaining to uh, Easter, such as the partial lamb, okay? And uh, partial is Greek, okay? Pa uh, Pascha 
is uh, Greek for Passover. All right, now. When we look at the goddesses Eostra and Ostara, the name Easter may have come from Eostra or Istra, E S E A S T R E, the Teutonic or Anglo Saxon goddess of spring and fertility, whose feast was celebrated around the start of spring. She is associated with the hare, H-A-R-E, which is a large rabbit, and egg, both symbols of creation. So the rabbit or the hare, H-A-R-E, is a symbol of creation just as the egg is a symbol of creation. So now we start getting, now we start seeing where these symbols come from that are put together in the Easter basket. And we have our children believing that rabbits lay chicken eggs because we don't know the backstory. Now, Ostara is a Germanic goddess who was always accompanied by a hare, a rabbit, possibly the ancestor of our modern Easter bunny. The association of both the rabbit and eggs with Easter is probably the vestige of an ancient springtime fertility rite. So, Going back to the uh, paper that Dr. King wrote dealing with the uh, influence of, of the mystery religions. I don't know how many people know this, but um, ministers and pastors, things like this, when they go through the seminary, they take a class, at least one class in comparative religions. They take at least one class in comparative religions. So the information that Dr. King was talking about, about Osiris and Isis and Horus, things like this, the, the ministers know this because they study this in their comparative religion class. They know this information. Now, how much they let you know that they know, well, that's another story. Some of them will readily admit it. Others may act like, they don't know what you're talking about or something, but they, they know this. So we have to, so, you know, next Sunday, people are going to have a lot of questions. They may have a lot of questions. You may take notes and go ask your pastor or, or Bible study, your Bible study class Wednesday night. Ask these questions. That's not to challenge anybody. That's to get a better understanding. That's why in Bible study, you use a study Bible. Okay. You use a study Bible, not a devotional Bible. In Bible study class, because you, it's designed to gain a deeper understanding, not to memorize passages, but to gain a deeper understanding. And if you take the stories of the Helios Biblos and trace them back, a lot of these stories trace back to ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, trace back to uh, uh, Sumer, uh, different Mesopotamia, different things of this nature. It'll reconnect African people to who we are. All right, now, Fat Tuesday. We hear about Fat Tuesday, right? What is Fat Tuesday? Uh, or Mardi Gras, okay? Um, it's an occasion of great festivity and merrymaking. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shrove Tuesday celebrated as a holiday in many places with carnivals, masquerade balls, and parades of costume merrymakers. And uh, the it comes from the French Mardi Gras comes from the French Mardi, meaning Tuesday, plus Gras, meaning fat, from the feasting on Mardi Gras before the Lenten uh, fasting season. Okay, now um, I want to go to let, let's look at this here. I saw some comments earlier today. And people were talking about Ishtar, the goddess Ishtar. And there's memes floating around on social media that try to say that Easter is named after Ishtar, okay, which is which is false. So let's look at this piece here from Scientific American called uh, Beyond Ishtar, the tradition of eggs at Easter. 
Beyond Ishtar, the tradition of eggs at Easter. And let me pull this up here. Where is this? I thought I had this. I think I have it up here. Yeah, this one right here from Scientific American. This is from March 31st, 2013. All right, let's flip over to this. Everybody give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast, share this broadcast on your social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in, tell them to ask, tell them to uh, post their questions, take notes. Okay, so this article is by Crystal DaCosta, March 31st, 2013, Beyond Ishtar, Tradition of Eggs at Easter. And in the article on page... Uh, two bottom of page two so she says that uh there is a meme floating around facebook that some some people have rallied around and are sharing as truth of easter it proclaims easter was originally the celebration of Ish ishtar i-s-h-t-a-r the assyrian and babylonian goddess of fertility and sex her symbols like the egg and bunny were and still are fertility and sex symbols or did you actually think eggs and bunnies had anything to do with the resurrection after constantine decided to christianize the empire easter was changed to represent jesus but at its roots easter which is how you pronounce ishtar is all about celebrating fertility and sex so this is like misinformation floating around on facebook and probably other social media platforms so it goes on to say clearly we all know that facebook memes are the ultimate source of information particularly when they uh when they make a biting point about something or some group that is not particularly favorably viewed but it is well known that under the roman empire christianity did indeed adopt the pagan tradition pagan, pagan rituals of conquered peoples as we already talked about in an effort to help convert them in an effort to help convert them it it worked very well it worked pretty well as a strategy as it allowed the conquered peoples to continue a semblance of their observances as they remembered and with time the population would be replaced with those who only knew the new traditions so the elders die out and then you have the children who don't know the uh traditions who don't know the ways of their ancestors and they just buy into the the new traditions imposed upon them by the conquerors by the colonizers this is not a secret however there are a, are a few things wrong with the ishtar meme that a simple google search will turn up now ishtar was the goddess of love and war and sex as well as protection fate childbirth marriage and storms s-t-o-r s-t-o-r-m-s storms there's some fertility uh, in there but as with aphrodite there is also an element of power her cult practiced sacred prostitution her cult practiced sacred prostitution where women waited at a temple and had sex with a stranger in exchange for a divine blessing blessing and money to feed hungry children or pay a debt ishtar symbols were the lion the morning star and eight or 16 pointed stars again symbols of power the word easter does not appear to be derived from ishtar but from the german eostra e-o-s-t-r-e -E, the goddess of dawn d-a-w-n and a bringer of light 
uh, English and German are in the minority languages that use a form of the word Easter to mark the holiday. Uh, elsewhere, uh, elsewhere, the observances is framed in Latin Pasha, which in turn is derived from the Hebrew Pesach, Pesach, P-E-S-A-A-C-H, meaning or associated with Passover. Ishtar and Easter appear to be homophones. They may be pronounced similarly, but have different meanings. So they may sound similar, but they're different. They're not the same thing. It's just like yesterday in my class, we talked about how Africa is not named after Publius Canea Scipio Africanus. Africanus is Latin, which means belonging to Africa or of Africa. And after the Battle of Lazama in 202 BC, where uh, Publius Canea Scipio Africanus defeats Hannibal Barca, the Battle of, the Battle of Lazama is going to be after that that he takes his surname Africanus. And the prefix in Africanus is in reference to the Afri, A F R I, the Afri. Who, who are a group, of, a group of black African people in Algeria and Tunisia. And Tunisia is in the area that used to be called Carthage. And the Carthaginians were black African people, descendants of the Phoenicians, and they're also descendants of the Garamantes. And the Garamantes are a larger group of African people that, people that the African Moors are descendants of, the Garamantes. So all this, all this history is, is, is connected. Okay, now, uh, the article goes on to say, uh, our helpful meme places the egg in Ishtar, Ishtar's domain, but Ishtar doesn't seem to be connected to eggs in any explicit way. However, there are plenty of other older traditions that involve the egg as a symbol of rebirth and feature it prominently in creation mythologies and feature it prominently in creation mythologies. Ancient Egyptians believed in a uh, primeval, uh, primeval, primeval egg from which the sun god hatched. Alternatively, the sun was sometimes discussed as an egg itself laid daily by the celestial goose Seb, S-E-B, the god of the earth, uh, or you may hear it referred to as Geb, G-E-B, Geb. The phoenix is said to have emerged from this egg. The egg is also discussed in terms of a world egg modeled by Kanum from a lump of clay on the potter's wheel. Okay, so you can read the rest of this here. But Easter is not from Ishtar. Because this is kind of lengthy article. This is at Scientific American. There are other sources on this also. Uh, Anthropology and Practices, the section Scientific American. Beyond Ishtar, the tradition of eggs at Easter, written by Crystal da Costa, March 31st, 2013. And Crystal da Costa is a, uh, she writes dealing with uh, anthropology. Okay, so check this out. Now, uh, I want to go to page. How's everybody doing? Wilbur said, thank you. Um, John and Matthew said, that's what's going on now. Okay. All right. Let's continue here. I want to go to page 95 of Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Let's look at this because this gives us helps give us a, gives us a deeper understanding here. And page 95, let's look at this here. So we talked about Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And uh, page 95 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization uh, 
Browder gives us a deeper understanding of this mythology. And he said, do I have the zoom in? Did I zoom in on this? What did I? Okay. He says that the story, so if you have the, the book at home, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, you can, you can pull the book out. This book right here. This is one of the books we use in uh, my 12-week online course also. You don't, you don't have to buy any of the books to follow along in the class. We do. Uh, uh, we show you excerpts of the book on the screen. But if you have it, you can use it. Okay. So page 95, Browder says, The story of Asar, Aset, and Heru is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, immaculate conception, virgin birth, and resurrection. Evidence of this Trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia or Ta-Nehisi, which is the mother of ancient Kemet, as late as 3300 BCE, as late as 3300 BCE, before the Common Era or BC, carved on the walls of the Temple of Luxor, circa 1380 BCE before the common era or BC are scenes that depict the following scenes that depict the following number one the so the bottom uh panel number one at the bottom my left the Annunciation the netter Dahuti who the Greeks called Thoth is shown announcing to the virgin Aset the coming birth of their son Heru, or who the Greeks called Horus, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. explained in his book dealing with the influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. Now, so this is the Annunciation. We've all heard of the Annunciation. The second panel depicts the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception, the Netter Neph, K N E P H, who represents the Holy Ghost, and the Netter Het Heru, who the Greeks called Hathor, are shown symbolically impregnating Oset or Isis by holding the Ankh, which is the symbol of life or the African symbol of eternal life, holding the holding Ankhs to the nostrils of the virgin mother to be all set. This is the immaculate conception. Number three, the third panel at the top, you see the virgin birth. All set is shown on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives, the birthing stool, because we had enough sense to know that it made more sense um, for the woman to sit on the birthing stool, let gravity take its course, than just to lay on your back and try to try to push the baby out. Okay, so they're depicting the, the, the birthing stool and attended by midwives. Number four, the adoration. The newborn Heru is portrayed receiving gifts from the three kings or magi okay as described in um uh malachi chapter 10 the book of malachi but it doesn't say how many it just says uh, uh wise men they just referred to as wise men or kings things like this it doesn't say how many while uh, while being adored by a host of gods and men now three the saying the three wise men three comes from the three stars in orion's belt Okay, the constellation of Orion the Hunter. And do I have, I have that here. Okay. The constellation of Orion the Hunter. Um, the three stars in Orion's belt. And we know that the star Sirius rises uh, around December 25th. The star Sirius rises to be in line with the three stars in Orion's belt. And they're going to point towards the sun also. The star Sirius, I'm sorry, the constellation of Orion, the hunter, in ancient times was the constellation of Asar. And uh, the constellation of, of Orion is followed by 
uh, two constellations called Canis Major and Canis Minor, the big dog and the little dog. The star Sirius is in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. OK, so Sirius is known as the dog star. Sirius is known as the dog star because it's in the constellation of the big dog, Canis Major. When we look at the old um, uh, logo of the sa satellite radio company Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, Sirius, the logo was a dog with a star over his head or a star on its head, which comes from the star Sirius, the dog star that's in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. Then you get into Dogon mythology. The Dogon talk about there from the star Sirius, things like this. When you study their mythology, the Dogon of, of Mali and Burkina Faso. Okay, I told you all this is connected together. Okay, all, all this history and culture, astronomy, all this is connected together. This is why we have to reclaim African history, reclaim our minds, take our minds back. And we don't ask permission to take our minds back. Okay, um, Bantu Stephen Biko said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed so we have to take our minds back and we, we don't ask permission to do that if we look at this article here from face to face africa.com which has a fantastic article as you see we post a lot of articles from face to face africa.com this article here uh is about the dogon and the Dogon originally come from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. They have a superior understanding of astronomy. And the Dogon are going to leave Kemet, probably going back to around four, 400 BC or so, because of invasions coming in. And they're going to uh, leave Kemet, go into Central Africa, and go into uh, the Mali in Burkina Faso areas in West Africa. The Dogon tribe of Mali discovered this invisible star centuries before Galileo invented the telescope. This is from June 26, 2019, by Ni uh, Ashele, uh, Ashe uh, Ashile, uh, A S H I L E Y. Here is a uh, picture of a Dogon, probably man wearing. Uh, one of the Dogon masks. The Dogon tribe is a community of people living in present day Mali. Their original original point of migration to their present locale is not known. However, some scholars have traced their ancestry to the ancient Egyptian empire. They are about 300,000 in population, occupying about 700 villages, with an average of about 500 inhabitants per, per village. The Dogon, tribe possess, the Dogon tribe possesses a rich oral history and knowledge of astronomy. A rich oral history, history and knowledge of astronomy. And this dates as far back as 3200 BC. As far back as 3200 BC. According to the oral tradition of the Dogon tribe, the star named Sirius A, the brightest star in the night sky with a bluish tinge, Sirius A, has an invisible companion star scientists have named Sirius B. So the Sirius A and Sirius B star system. Sirius A is in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog, Sirius A. This companion star is not only invisible to the naked eye, but also completes a trip around Sirius A every 50 years. Okay, they show Sirius A, Sirius B, and you see Sirius B is much smaller. Okay, now the Dogon have, have had knowledge of C Sirius A and Sirius B going back thousands of years. 
Now, knowledge of the presence of Sirius B as an invisible companion star to Sirius A and its orbit has been with the Dogon tribe for, for, uh, for long and it has been incorporated into their oral literature as well as customs and ceremonial rituals since the days of antiquity long before Galileo is reported to have invented the telescope in 1609. Sirius B, the invisible companion star of Sirius A, remained unseen until a large telescope was used to photograph it in 1970. Okay, so European astronomers basically didn't know about Sirius B until like 1970. But even before the invisible star was captured in the night sky by the telescope, Marcel Griol and Germain uh, Dieterlin, two uh, French scientists, are reported to have recorded information on the presence of Sirius B in the sky from four different Dogon priests, from four different Dogon priests, okay? So they're getting this information from the Dogon who already know about it. According to a Dogon oral tradition, a race of beings, a, a race of beings from the sky named Nomos gifted them with the knowledge of Sirius B. The Nomos, according to the oral tradition, looked like amphibians. The Nomos, according to the oral tradition, looked like amphibians. They came down to the Dogon, to the Dogon in what resembled an ark and also taught them many things concerning their own solar system. Facts that were observed years after Galileo is recorded to have invented the telescope. Okay. I think they mean facts before Galileo is uh, recorded to have invented this telescope. It is always interesting to discover how advanced in knowledge, skill, and wisdom the ancient African tribes were and the extent of their immense contribution to world civilization. If modern-day indigenous African Africans, persons of African descent, and the world at large will accord some respect and patience in a genuine bid to learn from the continent of Africa, her insights and highly guarded secret teachings can and will be made available for the healing of the world. Can and will be made available for the healing of the world. Okay, you can read the rest of this article here. I'm running out of time. The Dogon tribe of Mali discovered this invisible star centuries before Galileo invented the telescope. Now, when you study Benjamin Banneker and Benjamin Banneker did the surveying for the layout of Washington, D.C., and the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Kemet. And this is what our brother Tony Browder breaks down in Egypt on the Potomac, okay, his book, Egypt on the Potomac. This is one of the reasons why we use this book in our class, okay, because I know Browder personally. I've interviewed him a number of times. Fantastic book. Benjamin Banneker, it's believed that Benjamin Banneker's grandfather, I think, I think it was his grandfather, it's believed his grandfather was Dogon. And Benjamin Banneker had a superior knowledge of astronomy. Okay? So this is why when you see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered, I'm on every Friday as a panelist. You see me on Faranji Muhammad show, The Culture, on the Black Star uh network black star media network roland martin's network you watch the african history network show this is why when you hear me talk about reparations i say we first to when the concept of reparations the root concept means to repair to repair the damage of something that was done to make you whole again to restore you back to a state prior to when the damage was done to make you whole again this is why i say to repair the damage you first have to analyze who african people were and what african people had 
before we were put into an institution of chattel slavery that stripped us of African history, culture, language, spiritual systems, family ties, nationality, folklore, mores, cosmology, cosmology, all of that, our land. You have to analyze who African people were before the trauma was inflicted to understand how to repair the damage and what to restore us back to. Yes, cash payments can be part of the repairing of the damage. Cash payments alone is not reparations because you have not properly analyzed the damage that was done. What we should be striving for is to, is to be restored back to the status of our ancestors. If you start the analysis of African people in slavery, then you are already coming to the conversation at an intellectual deficit because you don't understand who African people were before we were put into the institution of slavery. That's why a lot of this stuff floating around masquerading as reparations is wrong. You haven't done a proper analysis. In cash payments can be part of a comprehensive reparations program to repair the damage. It's going to take a generation of repairing the damage. But watch the information that I, the, 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 the videos I have dealing with reparations. It's totally different than a lot of this stuff floating around. But see, I'm a historian. You first have to analyze who African people were before the damage was done because we need to be restored back to that. Not think that you are repairing the damage because we get a check of whatever amount however many zeros you want to put in it because our ancestors worked for 246 years for free that's not repairing the damage because you haven't assessed what the damage was then you have to understand the laws and policies that were put in place after slavery ended that bring us right to where we are today that has now distributed wealth pond resources into the hands of europeans because you have to change those laws and policies that continue to inflict the harm just giving a check don't address the laws and policies that have continued to inflict, inflict the harm and have done so for the past 158 years all right let's continue this ain't this is not a broadcast about reparations but once again, like I said, all this is connected. Okay, now, let me try to hurry up and finish this. Um, let's look at page, that was page 95. Let's look at page 198 of Now Valley Contributions to Civilization. Because page 98 deals with, um, let me see, let's go to this. I want to go to, no, I want, I want page 168, I should say. Page 168 deals with, um, that's 95, this is 168 right here. This deals with, understanding how ancient Kemetic deities influenced the deities of the Greeks and the Romans. And it talks about Dahuti, who we just saw on page 95, who delivered the Annunciation to Osset that she was going to give birth to Heru. Okay, so we see Dahuti here, the Ibis-headed uh, Netter, uh, who had who carries two staffs, and if we look at this here, okay, Dahuti, the Netter of science, writing, measurement, divine articulation of speech, and medicine, holds in his hands two staffs with entwined snakes. Okay, two staffs with entwined snakes. Each staff has a snake wrapped around it. One serpent wears the crown of Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt, and the other wears the crown of Lower Kemet, Lower Egypt. 
Dahuti was referred to as Thoth by the Greeks. Now, the second deity is Hermes amongst the Greeks. Hermes was the Greek equivalent of Dahuti, who is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes, a staff which has two entwined snakes. It was called the Staff of Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S, Hermes. In Greek mythology, in Greek mythology, um, he was associated with wisdom and the hermetic sciences were named in his honor. And we know Hermes is, uh, and we'll also hear him, him, hear him referred to as Hermes Trismegistus, this is going to be uh, very important when it comes to Freemasonry and the, and the books of Freemasonry. And Freemasonry is based upon a watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. Now, the third one that you see here, the third deity is Mercury. OK, now Hermes carries the staff of Hermes which is a staff with two entwined snakes. Dahuti carried two snakes, uh, two staffs. Each staff had a snake wrapped around it. Now, Mercury is Roman. It says Greek, but Mercury is Roman. Mercury is the Roman version of Hermes and Dahuti, and he is similar in all aspects. The staff that Mercury carries is called the caduceus, the caduceus. And it has been adopted as the universal symbol of medicine. Okay. So this is the caduceus. So when you see the caduceus and you see like uh, different medical associations have the staff with two snakes wrapped around it and the, and the rings of the wings of Ma'at or the rings of wings of Ra, that's an ancient African symbol that. Is, is basically stolen from Africa, but Africa does not get the credit for it. When you look at the symbol of the American Medical Association, it has a staff with a snake wrapped around it. Okay? So there's symbols of Africa all around us, whether it, whether it's uh, the Washington Monument, okay, which is a Tekken, okay, whether it's uh, the Caduceus, Etc. The, the symbols of Africa all around us. We have to become history detectives and understand how to decode these symbols and how to trace all this back to Africa so we can remember, so we can put back the pieces of our fragmented mind and, and help to recover because we have to recover psychologically from the transatlantic slave trade and after slavery. Uh, uh, the Reconstruction Era, Jim Crow Era, etc. The the trauma that's been passed down. We have to recover psychologically. Part of repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation and racism and redlining, housing discrimination, things like this, is to be is is to re, to be repaired psychologically. We're dealing with a people who have largely been taught to hate themselves. We've, we're dealing with a people who uh, most of us still have the uh, names of our former slave masters and don't know our original names, don't know our original nationalities, don't know our original tongues, don't know our original languages, have been cut off from our family ties. Just given a people who have largely been taught to hate themselves and who have been psychologically damaged money. We, if you want to, if we want to be honest, we all know if we all got a million dollars today, white people have it all back by this time next week. The only thing you would have done is stimulate their economy. The damage is still there. The laws and policies that continue to inflict the harm today and maldistribute wealth power resources are still there. You haven't repaired the damage. Okay. You, you, you can't, like I said, cash payments can be part of a comprehensive repairing of the damage program but just giving cash payments and think you're repairing the damage it is it, it's, it's, it's even worse than putting a band-aid over a bullet wound because you haven't even removed the bullet that's causing the trauma 
you pulling a you you're putting a band-aid over a wound with the bullet still in it causing the trauma you haven't even removed the bullet but let's continue because this is not a reparations presentation okay so that was uh page 168 we did that and i talked about patron saints right so what is a patron saint because what happens is when we, when we study christianity and they, they like to talk about all oh, the, the the africans they believed in many gods and things like this and they were all heathens and pagans and and and, and you know um well what they did in christianity well now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness okay uh just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true this means you have to do some research to understand what i'm talking about what they did in christianity was they replaced the netaru the forces of nature the different deities like coming from ancient kemet ancient egypt they replaced them with the patron saints and in the uh, okay so when when we just uh looked at uh page uh 168 of non valid contributions to civilization by tony browder and we looked at the uh the uh Dehuti, hermes and mercury okay and mercury is, is a messenger and Dehuti delivered the annunciation to the to the virgin all set okay well in the christian tradition who delivers the annunciation to the to the virgin mary that's gabriel the messenger angel gabriel the messenger angel delivers the annunciation just as the Houthi delivered the annunciation so what you're going to see in christianity you're going to see emissaries you're going to see helpers of the creator helpers of yahweh or or whatever name you want to put on it uh some people refer to some people talk about the elohim you're going to see helpers of the creator just as in ancient kemet they believed in one supreme force but the netter the 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 netter netter for uh, singular netter roof or plural were the different manifestations of that one supreme being in the different netter rule uh, dealt with different aspects of nature, whether it's fertility and love, sex, things like this, agriculture, what have you. It's the different manifestations of that one supreme force. Okay, now, uh, what was I going to? Uh, we want to look. Oh, patron saints. believe me i'm trying to hurry up and wrap this up but i have a list here of what to get through so i want to make sure we get through the information that i have laid out here because this is all pertinent to understanding easter Easter, oystra uh what is a patron saint if we look at britannica concise encyclopedia a patron saint is a saint to whose protection and intercession a person, society, church, place, profession, or activity is dedicated. The choice is usually made on the basis of some real or presumed relationship, like St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland because he is credited with introducing Christianity there. Now, Patrick, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Um, Pat, uh, Patrick is was a mass murderer. He killed thousands of Druids. I talked about this in my St. Patrick's Day um, broadcast. And we dealt with the history of Patrick, former British slave. Patrick wasn't Irish. He was British. His color wasn't green. It was blue. And he killed uh, Pope Celestine I, sent Patrick into Ireland in 432 AD to convert the Irish to uh, Christianity. And the Druids were dealing with a watered down version of the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And the Druids um, wore a helmet that had a uraeus on it. And uraeus is a cobra, a snake. Okay. And so when they talk about uh, 
Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. Well, first of all, Ireland is a cold climate. And uh, Ireland is an island. There's no evidence snakes were ever in Ireland. OK, but when they talk about Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland, they're not talking about snakes that crawled on the ground. They're talking about uh, snakes that walked on two legs and were known as Druids because the Druids, because of the cobra on their helmet, were known as the snake people. And what the what the Druids were teaching conflicted with the teachings of the Christian church. Because the Druids were talking about uh, acquiring knowledge and awakening the power of God inside of you, which is related to the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru. So this conflicted with what the Christian church was teaching. This, this, this is not attacking anybody, but you got to, we don't understand that we don't understand. Okay, so to force christianity on the on the irish they had to kill the druids cuz they were the ones with the knowledge let me bring up this uh i'm trying to bring this one up here hold on this slide this deals with the druids Which one is that? Okay, yeah. Understand the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, because we, we go deep into this uh, in the class. What's the slab on the Jewish right here? All right. So they had, they wore, the Druids wore a helmet like the priestly kings in ancient Kemet. Okay. And the word druid in old irish means he who knows he who knows and what the druids were dealing with their teachings it was it was called the gnosis or the true knowledge all right and what the ruling elite were dealing with in in europe was a watered down version of the teachings coming from ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. But what they gave to the masses, and th this is not attacking anybody, but what they gave to the masses was Christianity. And, and the masses were illiterate. The, like 90% of the European population were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. So, so they couldn't read the Bible that they were told was the word of God. So it was easy to manipulate them. But the ruling elite that gave the masses Christianity in, in Europe. Now, I'm not talking about early forms of Christianity because early Christianity prior to the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. A lot of early Christians believed in like types of reincarnation and a lot of your early christian saints were africans so early christianity looked a lot like traditional african spiritual systems because as professor james small one of my teachers professor james small talks about europeans took fragments from the periphery of african spirituality okay to form christianity islam and judaism he has a fantastic presentation that deals with um christianity islam judaism fragments of african spirituality where he goes deep into this all right so okay so let, let's move on because we could be here all night now i don't have that type of time or energy um uh, okay so we did uh page 168 we talked to oh patron saints let's go back to patron saints now in Christianity, the patron saints replaced the Netaru, all right? And if we look at patron saints like St. Maurice, who was a Moor, who was an African Moor, St. Maurice was the patron saint of Germany, okay? St. Patrick was the patron saint of Ireland, 
he's credited with introducing Christianity and the, the Latin language because um, he is conquering on behalf of the Roman Empire. This is 432 uh, AD Common Era. This is before 476 when the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed the western portion of the Roman Empire. So this is this is uh, fifth century uh, AD Common Era. Okay. You have Saint Nicholas of Amsterdam and Russia. Saint Nicholas is the patron saint uh to children and pawn brokers and money lenders and prostitutes things of this nature and it's going to be from saint nicholas that the the real person saint nicholas who was a, a third century third fourth century saint in myra which is modern day turkey this is where you're going to get the religious figure in the netherlands of center class center class and center class is in, in, in Dutch, in the Dutch language, center class means St. Nicholas. And it's going to be how the little kids, if they're in the room, tell the little kids, go in the other room, watch um, Paw Patrol or Doc Stuffins or something, Sesame Street. Uh, center class was a religious figure that wore a white outfit with a red cape and he had like a red and white hat similar to the hat that the pope wears which we know comes from the the uh, double crown of the pharaohs or the nasubitis from ancient kemet so from center class which means saint nicholas we get the secular character of santa claus santa claus means saint nicholas and santa claus has the red and white outfit with the red and white hat etc now the, the 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 depiction of santa claus is credited the, the 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 jolly fellow with the red and white outfit that's credited to a cartoonist named thomas nast n-a-s-t and one of the things in literature that really popularized Santa Claus, uh, the, the secular um, character of Santa Claus, is the poem, um, A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement, by the Reverend Clement Clark Moore, twice the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, okay? So that, that poem has been retold thousands upon thousands of times. Now, center class amongst the Dutch has a sidekick named Joie de Piet. Joie de Piet in Dutch means Black Pete. And Joie de Piet was a Moor, an African Moor. Now, in one of the versions of the story, uh, Joie de Piet, there was a battle between Joie de Piet and uh, center class. And Joie de Piet becomes a slave of center class. Now, some people may say he's a servant, okay? But he's a Moor. And what this does is this symbolizes the, the Moors being conquered, the African Moors being conquered, like in Spain. Okay, now, if we look at this article here, because we go, we, a lot of this information we get deep into in my 12 week online courses because we have a section of it where we deal with the history of the moors but this all like i said all this history is connected uh there's an article from the washington post really good article that deals with center class and uh in november december each year you'll see articles about protests in the netherlands because these you have uh these white people in the netherlands who will um they'll have a parade and they dress up as joie de piet these white people put on black face and put on afro wigs and they dress up like joie de piet and more and more protests each year are, are, are talking about how this is racist which it is is making fun of the moors now you have 
a lot of the white people who say, oh, no, we're not we're not racist or drop the Piet. You know, he's uh, uh, the reason why his face is black is because he slides down the chimney to let center class in. So center class can leave presents for the little boys and girls and drop the Piet that's soot. They say they actually say they say that's soot on drop the Piet's face. That's why he's black. It's nothing racist. No, it's, it's sit on his face. It's not on his clothes. The sit is not on his clothes. It's just on his face. Okay. So if we look at this, look at this article quickly. Center class and Joie de Piet. Why a holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. This is by Tracy Brown Hamilton, December 4th, 2018. Um, so she talks about this talks about talking to a child about racism and things like this. Um, she said, We live in the Netherlands, a country that generally prides itself on its liberal tolerance and post race identity. Uh, okay, she's talking about Eric Garner, the, the tradition, and she talks about the tradition of center class and Joie de Piet. On the second Saturday of November, the second Saturday of November, Joie de Piet, Black Pete, arrives in the Netherlands on a steamboat from where? From Spain. From Spain. And we know that it's the Iberian Peninsula where the Moors go into in 711 AD led by Tariq Ibn Ziyad. They go from Morocco into the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal. This is where they go, and, and they're going to they're going to uh, conquer the Vandals and the Visigoths, defeat them, and they're going to settle in uh, what we call southern Spain and call it Al Andalus, which basically means like to walk in the spiritual path, walk in the spiritual light. So they say that Joao de Piet comes in from Spain because that's where the Moors go into when they go into Europe, into into Spain. What today we call Spain. Okay, so arrives in the Netherlands on a steamboat from Spain, along with center class, a towering, thin, and plushly dressed figure. Hundreds of people gather to watch the steamboat arrive with Joie de Piet's dancing and waving while brass band music plays until center class disembarks on a white horse with Piet's walking at his side to greet and offer treats to children. The ritual repeats in various cities across the Netherlands until December 5th, the same day, uh, the, the name day of St. Nicholas, okay, December de December 5th. Joie de Piet is, according to folklore, an assistant to center class and of Moorish descent. He's an assistant to center class and of Moorish descent. Now, some version of the story, he's a slave. They dress it up and say, oh, he's a servant. But it's still symbolizing the, the, the Moors being conquered. Now, traditionally, since Joie de Piet's first appearance in a children's book in 1850, Joie de Piet is portrayed as a very dark-skinned character with large red lips, curly black hair, and giant hoop earrings, as many Moorish men wore giant hoop earrings and gold giant gold hoop earrings when Joie de Piet's appear in person they are portrayed by volunteers in blackface unlike Santa Claus who comes one night a year center class and Joie de Piet stick around for a few weeks leaving presents for children in shoes left out by the fireplace a nightly news program called center class journal covers the adventures and hijinks of, of center class and his servants and makes the experience both magical and believable for children. Okay, so read the rest of this here. I don't have time to get deep into this. Center class and Joie de Piet, why holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. Now, the Dutch, when, they, when they're coming to the U.S. in the early 1700s, they're bringing the what's the colonies then because this, this is before the American Revolutionary War 1775 so it's the colonies they bring uh this mythological this 
religious character of center class they bring that and it's going to be transformed into the secular character of santa claus all right now um uh, okay let, let's go back to the proper presentation i mean i want to see where i am because we got through a lot of this and um what was it uh oh yeah we talked about Tariq ibn ziyad and uh we talked about the uh the moors going into spain Okay, so the 711 AD, we know General Tariq ibn Ziyad leads his troops into uh, the Iberian Peninsula today, known as Spain and Portugal. Renoka Rashidi has a really good article on this Moors, Saints, Knights, and, uh, and Kings, the African Presence in Medieval and Renaissance Europe. Uh, it's an article from AtlantaBlackStar.com. And also, we use one of Renoko's um, books, actually, two of his books in the class uh where's uh black black star the african presence in early europe is one of them where's my black star black star the african presence in early europe where he gets deep into this information that's one of the books we use i don't know where to put my black star another one is This one right here, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. This is another book we use. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in the class, but um, we use these as reference. Black Star, I got to find um, Black Star. It's around here somewhere. But anyway, I think I put it in this, uh, I think it's in this stack here. All right, I can't find it. Here's a book everybody should have, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Dr. Chancellor Williams. Have and read. Don't just have it on your shelf. This right here, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Dr. Chancellor Williams. My black star, I don't know. It's, it's, it's in here somewhere. Here's uh, another book of Renault Foles that we use in the class. African uh, African star over Asia, the black presence in the East. This deals with the African presence in Asia. Okay, now let's continue here. Um, I'm gonna wrap up here in a few minutes. When you look at Morocco, where the Moors go in in 711 AD. Spain and Portugal is right above Morocco. Okay. And the Moors are going to settle in that southern portion of Spain, like I said, and call it Al Andalus. So when we look at things geographically, it tends to make more sense for us. All right. Let's see here. I'm almost done now when we look at okay so we dealt with patron saints let's talk about the passover i mentioned the passover earlier there's a good article from history.com official website of the history channel called uh passover And we different when we watch the Ten Commandments, we we hear about the children of Israel and um, fleeing from uh, Egypt, and they were slaves in Egypt and. Um, the, uh, the the Pharaoh was so cruel 
all, all, all this stuff. And then they're going to flee Egypt. Uh, and they're going to be led out by Moses. And they're, they're, Egypt is going to be uh, cursed with 10 plagues because they treated the uh, God's children so horribly. And God's going to punish them with 10 plagues and different things like this, right? There's a good article from the History Channel called Passover. Passover. I encourage everybody to read it. So they go through and they talk about um, the Passover. They, they talk about the Exodus, things like this. They talk about w w what we read in the Bible, those that read the Bible. Then they go through, because uh, they talk about the 10 plagues, things like this. According to the Hebrew Bible, Jewish settlement in ancient Egypt first occurs when Joseph, uh, uh, a son of the patriarch uh, Jacob and founder of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, moves his family there during a severe famine in the homeland of Canaan, etc. They talk about Moses and the parting of the Red Sea, you know, and the Pharaoh's men being killed when the Red Sea comes back together and drowns them then they talk about the 10 plagues and uh when pharaoh refuses god unleashes 10 plagues on the evil egyptians including turning the nile river red with blood and diseased livestock boils hailstorms and three days of darkness culminating in the slaying of every firstborn son by an avenging angel. Now, Professor James Small talks about this because he, he says when they talk about the Passover, they're talking about the murder of African male children because these were African people in Kemet, in Egypt. So if you're talking about killing every male child under two years old, who are you talking about killing? If you're talking about killing every male child under two years old in ancient Egypt, then who are you talking about killing? The Israelites, however, marked their door frames uh, of their homes with lamb's blood so that the angel of death will recognize and quote unquote pass over each Jewish household. Terrified of, fur of further punishment, the, the Egyptians convinced their ruler to release the Israelites and Moses quickly leads them out of Egypt. The, now, all this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you may disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some more research to understand what I'm talking about. The Pharaoh changes his mind, however, and sends his soldiers to retrieve the former slaves. The, 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 they're saying that the, the, the Hebrews were slaves in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. As, as the Egyptian army approaches the fleeing Jews at the edge of the Red Sea, a miracle occurs. God causes the sea to part a line, Moses and the followers to cross safely, then closes the passage and drowns the e evil Egyptians. According to the Hebrew Bible, the Jews now numbering in the hundreds of thousands, then trek through the Sinai desert for 40 tumultuous, tumultuous years. Now, one account was, it says about 2 million of them. Okay, they say hundreds of thousands. One account is about two million of them. Some may say uh, 1.5 million or a million. Okay, they 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 trek through the Sinai Desert. Now pay attention to this. They trek through the Sinai Desert for 40 years before finally reaching their ancestral home in Canaan, later known as the land of Israel. Okay, that's a good story. You know, right up there with Star Wars and um you know black panther and it's, it's a good story but let me let me ask you a question what did two million people eat in the desert for 40 years what i'm just i'm just asking this question i flunked sunday school okay i mean i mean the, what did two million people eat in the desert for 40 years or 1.5 million or 1 million where did 2 million people or 1.5 million or 1 million or, 100, or hundreds of thousands, where did they get water from 40 years in the desert? What, 
Where did they get clothes from for 2 million people for 40 years in the desert? Where did 2 million people eat in the desert for 40 years? I mean, just, just a question I have to ask. This is, I mean, this, this is a logical question. Okay? So let's, let's continue. Now, there's a section here, and I tell you, everybody read this. Don't take my word for it. name of this article is Passover from History.com, official website of the History Channel. It's called Passover. Okay? Where is it? Where's the title? Right here. Yeah, Passover. Go read this. Now, when you scroll down, there's a section here. That will definitely go outside the circumference of many people's awareness. Like I said, I, I learned that from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens. Questions of historical accuracy. Uh-oh. Questions of historical accuracy. Now, this is like the most important part of the entire article. Because it says for centuries... Scholars have been debating the details and historical merits of events commemorated during the Passover holiday. Despite numerous attempts, that means more than one. Despite numerous attempts, historians and archaeologists have failed to corroborate the tale, T A L E, of the Jews' enslavement in. And mass exodus from Egypt. They're saying when they go research this story, it's one thing to have a story in a book. But they're saying when they go research this story, there's no evidence to back this up that slaves that the Jews were ever slaves in ancient Egypt. And there's no evidence to document to back up a mass exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt. OK, this is not me saying this. This is what the History Channel is saying. Despite numerous attempts, historians and archaeologists have failed to corroborate the tale of the Jews' enslavement in and mass exodus from Egypt. Although the ancient Egyptians kept thorough records, no mention is made of an Israelite community within their midst or any calamities resembling the 10 biblical plagues. There is also, not my words, this ain't me saying this, there's also no evidence of large encampments in the Sinai Peninsula, because it's supposed to be like 2 million of them for 40 years in the desert. The Sinai Peninsula, the fabled site of the Jews wandering, or, and they said there's no evidence of any sudden fluctuation in Israel's archaeological record that would indicate the departure of and then the return of a large population. Do you realize that a thought the whole ecology of a country? But then also if there was two million people or a million and a half or a million wandering in the desert for 40 years, You still do you realize there'd still be an archaeological record of that? They'd still be dig digging up dead bodies from them for 40 years? It'll throw off the whole ecology. The vegetation, all that would be thrown off. And then if a large, uh, if a, uh, if a, a large massive number of people, a million, million and a half, two million, come into a country, they're not going to have a record of that. It throws off the ecology. You, you leave archaeological and ecological footprints. Now, you can write a story. But in the real world. There's evidence, numerous types of evidence of this. There's no evidence of any sudden fluctuation in Israel's archaeological record that would indicate the departure and return of a large population. A handful of scholars, including the first century Jewish historian Josephus, 
have suggested a link between the Israelites and the Hyksos, a mysterious Semitic people, possibly from Canaan, who controlled Lower Egypt for more than 100 years before their expulsion during the 16th century BC. Most modern academics, however, have dismissed this theory due to chronological conflicts and a lack of similarity between the two cultures. No, they want they want the Hyksos. Then the other thing is, because in the movie, The Ten Commandments, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I've seen the movie, no plan on watching it. But um, they, they showed the uh, Hebrews uh, building the pyramids. But when you, but when you study like real history, the ancient Egyptians stopped building pyramids close to a thousand years before the Hebrews were said to have even gone into Egypt. All the all the pharaohs didn't have pyramids. Uh, they stopped building pyramids in the sixth dynasty, right around it's right around twenty three hundred BC or so, right right in that era. They so the ancient Egyptians stopped building pyramids close to like nine hundred years, a thousand years before the Jews were even the Hebrews were said they have even migrated into Egypt. So why do they show them in the Ten Commandments the Hebrews building pyramids? All right, now. Uh, let me see. Okay, we got through that. Same thing. I have my checklist here. Make sure we get through all this. Ten Commandments. Okay, so one last article we're going to look at here is from time.com. Well, two uh, very quickly. The National Retail Federation has some good information dealing with the money that's involved in Easter. Once again, I'm not telling people don't celebrate Easter. Okay, you want to buy you want to buy your Easter outfit and things like that and go to church. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying we need to understand the history behind what it is we've been taught to celebrate. So we have a better understanding of what it is that we are participating in. And if you once you have all the information to understand this, you, you decide you want to still participate in Easter. That's fine. But once you have more information, it may alter or change how you decide to participate in these European holidays. So National Retail Federation, NRF.com, has information on Easter. Uh, seeds planted for record high. Easter spending, a closer look at what's driving the expected $24 billion in spending, which is up from about 20 million to, to uh, up from about 20 billion in 2022 is going to be an egg sighting Easter. Who the hell wrote this? Um, with consumer spending for the holiday expected to reach a new high of 24 billion by uh, $24 billion by the 81% of Americans who say they're celebrating according to the annual survey from the National Retail Federation and proper insights and analytics. Okay, National Retail Federation and proper insights and analytics. Uh, here's a closer look at how some consumers are making their springtime celebration memorable. Decorations and flowers blooming to new heights. Okay, so they go through and break all this stuff down. But it's expected $24 billion will be spent uh, during the Easter season, uh, clothing, buying clothes and Easter eggs and chocolate Easter eggs and uh, uh, jelly beans and all different types of things like Easter baskets and all different types of things like this. OK, so check this out from the uh, National Retail Federation. They have information there on Easter seeds planted for record high Easter spending. Okay, now lastly, there was, and I think this is last because I'm looking at my checklist here. Uh, okay, I'll show you something from BibleGateway.com because we didn't do that earlier. And then also uh, we'll look at the etymology of the word Jesus. And that, that should be it because I have a list here of things to make sure to talk to you all about today. So there's a, a good article from Time Magazine, time.com. Here's why easter eggs are a thing here's why easter eggs are a thing 
and this is okay yeah time.com right here we'll pull this up now also if you like this type of information if you want to learn more about our history if you want to take uh, uh, one of my online classes our next class is uh, Saturday uh, April 15th next class meets Saturday April 15th 2023 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time it's ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school you can register for the class right now we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch it anytime okay so uh, we have it right on the home page of our website the African history network.com the African history network.com when you scroll down you'll see it as soon as you register you can start watching the previous class sessions the class is on sale uh regularly 130 dollars is on sale only 60 dollars and this class is saturday april 15th then we have april 22nd april 29th and um also uh may 7th okay we do a 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time click right here to register for the full course we do a thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place here's a, here's a free video you can watch also you'll you will also get five of my lectures in digital format uploaded into the video library when you register for this full course on sundays i teach black resistance movements from the haitian revolution u.s civil war civil rights movement and black power movement 1800 to 1968 I've been studying history 31 years now. Um, so I've been doing the African History Network show 13 years. We've done probably what 1,300 episodes, hundreds of interviews. Um, so people see me, uh, I speak across the country. But this class here, we deal with history from 1800 to 1968 to see what leads up to the Civil War taking place. Uh, then we studied the Civil War, Reconstruction Era, 1865-1877, uh, Jim Crow Era, Great Migration, World War One, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. To understand what happened to us after slavery ended, what were the laws and policies put in place to put us where we are today to understand where we need, need to go from here. So next classes are Sunday, uh, April 16th, Sunday, April 23rd, April 30th, and May 7th okay 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time uh so even after this 12 week online course is over with you can go back and watch it anytime a year from now two years from now you have full access and we also have a bundle pack where you get both classes for uh on sale a hundred dollars uh that's a 300 that's a 300 dollar value okay and if you want to support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app because it takes a lot of work to um do this type of research it takes a lot of work and resources to be able to do all this run the african history network so you can support us uh through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app is our official cash app tag uh here or through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show so you can click on these links here this takes you to our uh paypal and cash app uh, information here and our qr code for cash app is right here also okay and if you've taken any of my online courses in the past you will get a 50 percent discount when you register for these classes so you get the bundle pack for uh 50 dollars for the bundle pack email us through the website or email us at ahn show at the african history network.com ahn show at the african history network.com you are a returning student so you'll get a discount okay if we look at this article here from time magazine um name of this article is here's why easter eggs are a thing here's why easter eggs are a thing okay and this is from this is by olivia b waxman um april 6 2023 it was updated i want to scroll down look at this piece here the origin story of easter eggs in medieval europe the origin story of easter eggs in medieval europe uh starts in medieval europe but it may or may not have originated with christians according to some the 
first Easter eggs actually belong to a different religious tradition. Quote, many scholars believe that Easter had its origins. Um, Easter had its origins as an early Anglo-Saxon festival that celebrated the goddess Easter, that celebrated the goddess Easter, E-S-E-A-S-T-R-E. And the coming of spring, celebrated the goddess Easter and the coming of spring, the season spring. In a sense, in a sense, a resurrection of nature from uh, after winter. In a sense, a resurrection of nature after winter. Carol Levin, professor of history and director of the medieval and renaissance studies program at the University of Nebraska Tales Time Magazine in an email. Quote, some Christian missionaries hoped that celebrating Christian holy days at the same times as pagan festivals would encourage conversion, especially if some of the symbols carried over, especially some of the symbols that the quote unquote pagans were celebrating carried over to the new Christian celebrations. Eggs were part of the celebration of Easter. Apparently, eggs were eaten at the festival and also possibly buried in the ground to encourage fertility. So this is where like the Easter egg hunt comes from because they were burying eggs in the ground. So then you go have an Easter egg hunt to go find these multicolored eggs okay and they have different colors different bright colors to represent spring and rebirth so read this all read the rest of this article here uh here's why easter eggs are a thing from from time magazine time.com all right now um lastly here I didn't get a chance to go to BibleGateway.com, 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 15, verse 4. Because this talks, this goes back to what we're talking about in the beginning. And it deals with... Um, the resurrection. Let's see, this is okay. This is what I want here. Buried. Okay, raise. Okay, right. So let's look at this quickly here. BibleGateway.com. This deals with the resurrection on the third day. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to uh, Cephas, then to the twelve. Okay, so raised on the third day. All right, now, uh, so we did that. Talk about the winter solstice. Then it is Easter. Okay. Ten Commandments. We did all that. Oh, the etymology. Uh the etym online etymological dictionary. I didn't get a chance to show you this here. Etymonline.com. You look up Jesus in the dictionary. You want to go to a uh, use an etymological dictionary, or you can use Webster, American, what not Webster, not Emmanuel Lewis, but uh, Miriam Webster. Okay, that's fine. You can do that. But the etymological dictionary. This is what I. This is the one I use. Etymonline.com. This is one of the ones I use. I use different uh, dictionaries and encyclopedias. This is uh, online etym etymology dictionary. This is etymonline.com. You look up Jesus 
and what, what what does it show here personal name of the christian savior late 12th century it is it is the greek form of joshua it is the greek form of joshua used variously in translations of the bible it's from the late latin Iesus, I E S U S, Iesus, properly pronounced as three syllables, um, from the Greek. I uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. I E O S U S, which is an attempt to render into Greek the Aramaic Semitic proper name Jeshua, which is uh, in Hebrew Yeshua, Yeshua or Yahshua, in so Yeshua is Hebrew. Yeshua means Jah is salvation. Jah is salvation. This was a common Jewish personal name during the uh, Hellen Hellenizing period. It is it is the later form of the Hebrew uh, Yahshua, Y E H O S H U H. Okay. So read this. So Jah is salvation. So when you listen to reggae music. And you listen to Rastafarians and things like this. They, they're talking about Jah. Okay. That's what this is in reference to. Jah is salvation. I told you all this is connected. You listen to Bob Marley and they talk about, uh, or, you know, different types of reggae music. They talk about Jah. That's what this is in reference to. This is all connected. All right. Now, um, Let's see here. Okay, Jana uh, said that's why the pagan holidays are wrong. Um, let's see. Chocolate chip is in the house, says uh, so of our young people needs to understand. I think she means so many of our young people needs to understand where we started from. And as Mr. M. Hotep stated, that they will know where they belong in our history. You know, when I was talking about uh, reclaiming our history, reclaiming our minds and repairing the damage of uh, legacy of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, et cetera. Smitty Rock 70 said, interesting. Okay. Uh, John Matthews uh, posted some emojis. Um, all right. Okay, one uh, pretty boy eleven said, "Great show and information." All right, so I think I covered everything. So we went longer than I had anticipated, but this is a lot of information. Like I said, this is all this history is connected together. And I have a lot of this information. I teach this, a lot of this history. So uh, it is what it is. All right. Well, look, uh, be sure to follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live as well. Uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, uh, you can email me right through the website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We can make that happen, either um, a in-person presentation or virtual presentation. Juneteenth is coming up uh, as well, and um, uh, Juneteenth is coming up. Marcus Garvey's birthday, August 17th, Malcolm X's birthday, uh, May 21st different celebrations festivals are coming up so you can email me at ahn show at the african history network.com or email me through the website be sure to register for the online courses that i teach also and um that's going to do it for us okay so hope you learned hopefully you learned a lot today and uh be sure to follow us on our social media platforms oh instagram it's uh, Michael M. Hotep on Instagram, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, Michael M. Hotep on Instagram also. We have to get out of here. Remember, right now is correct wrong behaviors, not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. Thanks for tuning in.